Recording in progress. Welcome everybody um, to the final Marcos Voices of 2023. Um, awesome great time. I just want to welcome you all to the library and thank, as always, the LCT Foundation and the Long Beach Library Foundation for making this series possible. I'm really excited that with tonight's guest, we're enlarging what Marcos Voices includes to include the fiber meeting and podcast. And with that, I'm going to bring Chris Cow from CC up to give the introduction. So, hi. <laughs> Andrew Stauer from uh, the College and Director of the Northwest Voices Program. And I am so excited uh, that I've spent the day so far with Sarah Marshall uh, from Portland, Oregon, uh, who does a wonderful podcast, which I'm sure many of you are already acquainted with because I saw some merch out in the audience. Uh, I'm wrong about uh, which it attempts to correct um, pop culture going wrong, media stories that are of the kind, particularly to women, uh, and and kind of one of the terms that Sarah used in one of the podcasts, the way that it's roadkill, but you know, which I think is something I want to keep repeating because I think mean, it's particularly true. Uh, Sarah also co hosts a podcast called You Are Good. Uh, Bill is a feelings podcast about movies with Alex Steed. Um, she's working on a new series about uh, satanic panics uh, and a book uh, on women uh, that uh, she may talk about. So, um, without further ado, please welcome Sarah Marshall. So nice to be in the beautiful library. Beautiful, iconic New York Post Um, I was thinking today, I feel like Southern Washington is spiritually a part of Oregon, and maybe you all completely disagree with that, but it's how I feel. Um, so I'm right at home. I love that we're being watched over by this mysterious portrait. Um, <laughs> So I have a couple different things to read for you today, which hopefully are enjoyable whether you listen to podcasts or not. The first one is something of an appetizer that fell into my lap earlier where I've gotten what I'm almost positive, thank you, um, is a scam text. And I decided to see how far I can keep this going and have I don't know, you see what happens. So here's our conversation. Um, I'll, be, I'll be here when it's the scammer, and I'll be here when it's me, so I don't understand. Hey, I found you in the address book. I didn't put your name in it. I thought we knew each other. <laughs> Maybe we do. What is your name? Yes, my name is Judy. I forgot about you. How did your phone number end up in my address book? I'm not sure. Where do you live, Judy? Judy has a Los Angeles area code. <laughs> May I have your name? My name is Brian. <laughs> Hi, Brian. I'm from Seattle. What about you? Oh, fun. I am from Portland. Maybe we met at a party. Lol, your name sounds like a gentleman. <laughs> yes, I try to be. <laughs> Lol, your talk is very interesting. Sorry, I've never been to Portland. If you don't mind, can you share a photo? Let me think about who you are, and I will be the same. <laughs> um, sure, I'll find one to send. Is a photo the first picture that came up on my phone when I searched the word man? <laughs> they don't know who this is, but it's a really nice smile. Sorry, this is a bit grainy, LOL, crap some people out. LOL, it doesn't matter. Many people only value appearance, but I think what is needed is more inner communication. <laughs> and we're continuing. Judy has just told me most recently, maybe we can share photos with each other so we can get to know each other better. I heard you sent my photo, Judy. <laughs> and then she says, I am 35 years old, which is fun because I am 35 years old. And I love that this Scam approach is based on the idea that all I want wants is to meet a 35 year old woman. Scam's true. Um, okay, and so I brought a couple things. And I'm going to read, it's going to be a slightly, maybe a weird kind of a reading. 
because we're reading through the chronology of my kind of journey being a writer and then not a writer, and then getting back into it because I wrote my entire life when I was growing up. It was the first thing I wanted to be aside from an oceanographer during the inevitable second grade oceanography phase. Um, really wanted to go down on a submersible, but I did age well. <laughs> and that was the writing and kind of being inside the place in my mind that I could create when I was writing was one of the first places that I felt really free and felt comfortable and able to kind of experience life fully in a way and sort of the project of growing up for me was taking that feeling of freedom and bringing it more into meat space existence. And so the beginning of my career, I bought or I brought this from my mom's house because I don't have any copies of it, but she has eight. Uh, with the article on the believer about Tony Harding. And this came out in 2014 was the first thing I wrote that, you know, any more than a couple dozen people ever read. And it's very prescient in terms of the podcast that I ended up doing. You don't have to have listened to to see uh, the prediction here. You remember the, the, the podcast is called You Were Wrong About. And then here's the opening of the article. It's called Remote Control. And I was in grad school, so I thought you had to put the word spectacle and everything all the time. So the subtitle is Tanya Hardy, Nancy Kerrigan, and the Spectacle to Female Power and Pain. Um, the secret to academia is that your article titles, if you want to sound really smart, your article title is normal phrase, colon, something, something, and a third thing. And then you're off to the races. <laughs> you don't have to listen very closely to realize you've been wrong for all these years. It's not a difficult phrase to remember and she repeats it again and again and again. Clutching her knees, she rocks back and forth like a child hurt on a playground. It is, in fact, not a phrase at all, but a word, just one. And though we hear it mostly as a keening, inarticulate wail, it's also impossible to miss here. The word is why. In the video, which will be shown on the news again and again in the weeks that follow the incident, she says the word three times. Stopping only when she is spirited away from the cameras in her father's arms, her face pressed fearfully to his. She looks in her lazy white costume like nothing so much as an anxious man bride being carried over a threshold she isn't quite sure she's ready to cross. When this was first published, I also got a piece of criticism, but that was really trying way too hard as a metaphor. And uh, that's true, but I like trying too hard. <laughs> and so this article ended up being very, very long um, and all about kind of what Tanya Hardy means. And this was on the 20th anniversary of the China Olympic scandal, where a hitman hired by a friend of her husband's, whose actions she was interestingly blamed for in their entirety, assaulted her primary rival, who was on her way backstage after a practice session. Um, and for six weeks, it was all I wanted to talk about. And then we all moved on. And I talked about this. Uh, this morning, but the thing that really was fast, the, the thing that I can look away from, and the thing I think I grew so much by doing was kind of looking at a story that was told very simply at the time that there was this girl, she was trashy, we were all supposed to know what that meant. She wasn't doing her gender correctly, she was in a sport that was all about uh, refined femininity. And she was sort of powerless to figure out what that actually was. And she would like try to not be so much of a tomboy. And she would have long red nails and like fluffy bangs and blue eyeshadow. And it would be like, be more feminine. No, not like that. And this kind of belief that she could do the thing that everyone, she could be the thing everyone wanted her to be, but she was choosing not to be out of sheer stubbornness, apparently. Um, and that. To command attention as a woman in the public sphere uh, without having earned it by filling precisely the mold that you have been expected or trained to fill in is so serious a crime that you are capable of any act of moral depravity. Um, and that was fascinating to me. It was fascinating that 
I had grown up, I was, you know, kindergarten, first grade, and all this was happening. I kind of looking for my first cues about what gender was about, and what class was about, and what living in this country was about. And, you know, that all of us look to the stories around us to try and figure out who we are and who we are allowed to be. And that there's something very powerful about looking at the truth that seems so apparent that nobody has to say it out loud at the time and kind of pulling apart the layers and pulling apart the layers and realizing that there's nothing really inside of the package. Uh, it's all just assumptions and social norms that we've taken on but that have no real connection to truth, that someone can be um, a lover of heavy blue eyeshadow and have something to do with their moral compass, and someone can be rough around the edges, um, not because they don't have as much humanity as everyone else, but because trauma has a way of making us less lovable rather than more lovable, at least to uh, outside appearances. And so, fast forward, I'm writing out a storm. I started doing a podcast, all is well. We have a pandemic, you all remember that probably. And it all affected us differently, but the way, one of the ways it affected me, um, aside from really ramping up some incipient OCD tendencies, was making it so hard for me to imagine writing anything ever again, because there's something about both the kind of energy that takes and the kind of state of energy deprivation we were all in, or most of us were in, that I think makes it, you know, has affected many of our relationships with the things that we used to have a pretty uncomplicated relationship with. Um, but also that writing to me is one of the most effective ways of understanding what's in your own brain, and that there are periods when it can feel overwhelmingly scary to even look in there. Um, you have to close it up. And so I wanted to also read something that I just wrote that's me kind of trying to come out from those shadows. Um, who here is going to use these? Yeah, I just thought about it. Okay, three hands for you. Um, I can put one of you on the spot to say what news uses, or I can just do it myself. I just write it all the time. <laughs> news uses a perfect, iconic, flawless film that Disney made and had in theaters for like 25 minutes in 1992 um, because it is, and it's so iconic because it is a Disney musical about going on strike as a child laborer. It's pretty rich, but not a make a movie about. Um, but it's a movie that did, you know, made basically no money at the time and then developed a very spirited fandom among teenage girls. And so I wrote a piece uh, that came out in early 2018, RIP the Teenies, um, just kind of as an appreciation of movies. And I was doing it because of so many of the things I wrote as a freelancer then. Someone had said, yeah, sure, do it, I guess. We'll give you $200. Um, and so here's a little bit of that music piece. Um, and this was a piece that I had to come back to recently to write a new introduction for it to be anthologized, and I spent avoiding returning to this piece. Didn't want to read it, didn't want to see my younger self sounding like an idiot, didn't want to see my younger self doing a better job than I thought I could do now, didn't want it. Um, finally, I was forced to through just the fact that I had killed all the time I said. And so here's the opening. Imagine, just for a moment, that Disney once made a musical about labor unions. The musical would, of course, need to begin by showing the workers in question, and so it would open by panning through the newsboy's lodging house. Maybe the whole thing would feel like a kind of playboy grotto for teenage girls, who are, presumably, the audience this movie would be targeting, though who even knows. Rosy cheeked boys would lie draped across each other on narrow bunk beds, limbs tangled up, and hair plastered to their foreheads with sweet, clean sweat. Too so much. The premise would get even stranger, and moreover, who not broke, who was left from their beds, ran through the streets singing. 
The strangest thing about this imaginary movie is that it actually exists and was once in theaters. Sort of. In April 1992, the movie was played in US theaters for two weeks, managing to scrape together a $2.8 million gross on a budget of $15 million before it was yanked off the screen. What I find hard to believe, Roger Ebert wrote in the movie, is that anyone thought the screen is that anyone thought the screenplay based on these actual events was of compelling interest. Newsies is like warned over Horatio Alger. I saw the movie at a Saturday morning preview attended by hundreds of children. From what I could see in here, the kids didn't get much out of it. Maybe the combination of low box office and dismal reviews convinced Disney that it was best to take Newsies back out, out back and put it out of its misery. And maybe too, the corporation is feeling a little buyer's remorse about somehow producing a movie that was so positive about the newsboy strike of 1899 and in the process about how fun it is to go on strike and make things hard for a corporation. And boy, are they regretting now. And if there is even a shadow of truth to the latter, then it makes what happens next all the more satisfying. Newsies was quietly released on video and quietly changed the hearts and minds of a generation of schoolgirls. It helped us find each other. It asked us to think about politics and it inspired us to write a lot of gay erotica. <laughs> and then I get to the greatness of Christian Bale's performance in this movie, the only film he's been in where he does not know what accent he's doing. <laughs> um, and then into the, I'm trying not to use the word iconic so much, but it's just kind of bound to happen. The iconic relationship between Jack and David. And this is what I wrote about that. There is something majestic about Christian Bale's performance in Newsies as Jack Cowboy Kelly, the striking boys leader. Um, I'm sorry, I searched that based on the word sweaty, but I used the word sweaty to write the twice in this, and that was the paragraph where I used it for the first time, and then here's the correct paragraph. The chemistry between Jack and David is instantaneous and electrifying. You know, from the side of the story, that the movie finds comfortable making explicit, that they share the kind of friendship that brings you the other half you never knew you needed. Loud where you are quiet, impetuous where you are circumspect, circumspect Charismatic where you are shy, fearless where you are hesitant, sweaty where you are keen. Adolescent girls, of course, knew plenty about finding the lost other, know plenty about finding the lost other, suddenly in a new friend. They know plenty, just as I knew plenty then, about friendship that bridges into the territory of romance, sometimes animated by sexual desire or some part of the crush, and sometimes simply because a love so big can not do anything but rupture and flower for it from whatever socially dictated relationship you have tried to keep it in. Jack and David had that kind of friendship, it seemed to me, one that contained a love both jagged and tender. Um, and I'm revisiting this because I was under the gun to write an introduction coming up on six years later. I read it, I thought, that's pretty good. I'm not a nerds. And then went and uh, wrote the intro. And that is something that is much newer than any other piece of writing I have. And I am excited to share a little bit of that with you to kind of wrap up. And then I would love to talk about any questions, any writing related things, any anything. Um, so I just don't think there's that many, many minutes of read aloud work that the human brain can process in an evening. I'd love to hear you have to say. So let's see. And I'm also going to quote from a really fantastic book that I recommend reading, which is called Everything I Need I Get from Hegel How Fan Girls Created the Internet as We Know It. Mm -hmm. When listing out pivotal so cultural moments, Caitlin Tiffany writes, and everything I need I get from you, hardly anyone would think of fangirls. Yet a fangirl still exists in contradiction to the dominant culture. She's not considered normal or sane. Her refusal to accept things the way they are is one of her defining characteristics. Tiffany's book uses the One Direction fandom as a case study, but so much of what she describes, changing technology society, feels interchangeable with my own adolescence. We loved the newsies, but they were also an excuse for love, a fair field where we directed our festival tents and made a world we liked better than the ones we were trapped in all day. 
that the adults in our lives thought so little of what we were doing that they didn't think about it at all, only clarified that feeling of freedom. No one would ever try to take this place from us. There is no correct way to be part of the fandom, so no one can tell us, as they did about seemingly everything else, that we were doing it wrong. It seems clear to me that this is a huge part of the Newsies fandom's power, then and now, and for as long as teenagers can say and held it for us, as a place for queer awakening and play. I knew this when I wrote the piece I'm introducing, but there was still a lot I hadn't figured out. Adolescent girls know plenty about friendship, I wrote, that verges into the territory of romance, sometimes animated by sexual desire, or some shard of fresh, and sometimes simply because a love so big cannot do anything but rupture and flower for it from whatever socially dictated relationship we would try to keep it in. This is one of the most positive things I have ever read in my life, and I wrote it. I was occasionally leaving the window open for people who identify as queer without ever identifying myself that way. And I realize now that without ever thinking about it consciously, I was leaving the window open so my older self would fall in. Because queer identity is bigger than gender and sexuality, because the age spectrum is big and bright, because in many ways, it's queer simply to stand outside and stand around a heteronormativity and focus your energy on all the big loves of friendship, because all this is true and dear to me. And also, when I wrote this piece, it was still easier to say that I was a factory reject person as a straight person. It was easier to celebrate others than it was to accept myself. Of course, in many ways, it still is. But in a few more years, I'll read this again and see how much I didn't know. And it was fiction. And I knew it would be that my dumb little field mouse brain kind of takes a while to figure these things out. It felt really lovely to come back to this piece and see what I did a few years ago and see what I didn't and sort of leave a notch on the tree saying, here's what I figured out so far again. Um, and thinking of it all not as kind of a performance that you're trying to reach some kind of pinnacle of or as something that is connected even to goals of what you're trying to accomplish in terms of prestige or kind of the scale of the project that you imagine doing, but that writing also for me and for so many of us is a way of telling the truth about yourself by attempting to offer what truth you know to other people. Um, and I feel in this moment, and I'm sure I'll backslide in about an hour, but in this very moment, so lucky uh, and so happy to be taking part uh, in, in this art form that we get to share with each other um, and in this really beautiful library. So that's what I'm reading. Thank you. And now, questions for Great. I, I like, I have absolute power here. It's a very exciting. Who wants to help? If no one asks me a question, we can just text beauty for a while. <laughs> I'm curious of Judy's motives. So, you know. What, what about you? I'm curious of Judy's motives, you know. Yeah. To find out that. The effect of what's happening is that they're like, hi, I found your number. What's your address book? Who this? And then they're like, let's connect on Telegram and then send you a link that like does something nefarious. So I just want, I want to know about Judy's life. <laughs> I do, but like very sporadically, and I feel like I'm um when I journal, I know that like I have just a better sense of what's going on in my brain. I feel kind of more balanced, um, and it feels like and there's actually a book and an audio book version of it that I really love and recommend called Catching the Big Fish by David Lynch. And he reads it himself, which is really great because it's like. There's a lot of short sections that aren't necessarily connected. So at a certain point, you feel like you're driving David Lynch home from school. And years later in your car, and he's like, smoking. The thing about smoking, you know, and you're like, oh, you can't. But it's really lovely. And one of the, it's mostly about creativity and meditation and just sort of metaphors that 
your consciousness is the container that you go fishing for ideas in. And so if you want to increase the size of the ideas and like get bigger fish, you have to develop a larger consciousness. And the meditation really helps with that. And I find, uh, especially as I and so many of us are kind of behaviorized to like be so stressed when there isn't like noise playing in our ears, like the idea of sitting in silence trying to meditate is unbelievably intimidating to me, but I think, you know, very, very belatedly, I think I realized that journaling feels like a way of doing that, where you're just kind of observing your thoughts and not kind of drinking what comes out and simply putting it down. And then, I don't know, but it's, it, it's very useful to me as a way of kind of reaching some kind of sense of, of peace. But yeah, I, do, I, I want to do it more. I think I need more solid routines, but yeah. But I, I read that you uh, keep notebooks, so maybe you don't journal, but but yeah. organize everything. And what's your you do your research in notebooks? What do you do with your notebooks? I do, yeah, I do. I do a lot of research in notebooks, and I'll find these frenzy notes a year later and be like, "Who's what's this move?" You know. But yeah, I I really like um, writing by hand as a way of thinking through things because I feel you know so much of our work life, many of us like. Or even if not our work lives and like our email lives and our Facebook marketplace lives take place on computers and kind of on screens and it feels like you know what I like about writing by hand is that you your hand sort of at a certain point feels like it's working on its own. Um and I just yeah I feel like I will take notes throughout researching something that may be completely useless to me at any actual later date, but it's just kind of and actually, when I'm working on a, a longer essay, which I haven't done in a while, I will kind of go through my reading materials and write in longhand a lot of the quotes that I'm thinking about using because it feels like a way of giving my brain a lot of extra time to think about what I actually think about. There's actually a quote by Thomas that I told you guys I went to uh, my mom's house to get a copy of a magazine because that's beyond my capability at this point. I'm relying on her for the archival stuff, but I found uh, just an old notebook in my closet where I had written down this quote, which I completely forgotten about, but really was happy to find this by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. If only there were people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil passed through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? I love that. Yeah. And that's nice because you're like, leave presents for yourself mm -hmm. later on. Are they linear? Or do you like draw shapes and like pictures and and uh it's like yeah, summoned in from all angles. So you really use the page, uh, yeah. in the way you would really use the computer. Well, I don't I learned, yeah, it's true. And well, you could try and use words that way, but it would be a living nightmare, I think. But um, no, I remember taking a colonial lit class. I am breathing into this so much, by the way. It's very out of breath for the <laughs> standing still. It's very hard. Um, but I, yeah, I took a colonial lit class where we talked about like the logs and journals of Ben Franklin and how he was like very much flaunting his wealth by writing these very wide margins and like line breaks when like most writing of the period is like you're just like every single tiny little scrap every bit of paper you're trying to put something put a word on and i love that was, ben franklin was able to flex by be like do your diary i ben franklin <laughs> But that's like so much of the really American studies is talking about how much we hate them, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I like him because there was that, I think it was a Disney movie. It was like one of the lesser Disney movies, or like just somebody else made it called Ben and Me when I was a kid, where he sent a mouse up on this stupid kite experiment and scared that mouse to death. I choose to believe that movie is history. <laughs> Not bad. Um, okay. Anything else? Any, any, any questions on anything? Not just in writing. Yeah. Right. Uh, we have 
challenge like writing an essay and doing like a podcast episode the same or different for you? That's another process of like, yeah, yeah, and that's a pretty great question. Thank you. I feel like what I love about doing a podcast episode is that you know, other people can kind of be alone in the studio or kind of be monologuing to themselves, and I find that very tough. I have to have a real person to be talking to, or at least like a very realistic decoy. Um, and so I do that show, but I find to be such a relief about it, and I think it's probably made it. You know, easy for me to avoid some of the more difficult aspects of writing is that, like, you're not alone in there. You have a person to talk to, and they bring their knowledge, and you bring yours, um, and you each bring your own perspective. And that, you know, it feels so good about it is that, you know, all through when I was in college and grad school, like, my favorite part of it was getting obsessed with the topic and then meeting a friend for coffee and being like, all right, here's the situation, here's what I'm into, and here are my big questions. And then you would kind of have these fascinations that you would get to share with each other, and that life kind of felt so rich in that way. And so I love having created somehow incredibly a job where I get to do kind of my favorite part of that um, for a living, where you get to come together and talk to somebody about something that they have put a lot of time and research into, and then you get to learn from them, and you also get to say, oh, let's do this other thing. Have you ever, have you ever think about this parallel? And that it's truly, and it's in the moment and very collaborative. And there's something about it. And probably the kind of the biggest connection I see is that like there are both things that when they're going well, I am forced to be absolutely in the moment. Um, and that feels so good for somebody who is not successful with being in the moment at like any other time. Uh, and so writing, I feel like one of the ways that it's been tempting to avoid it the last few years is that like you get in there. And famously, it's just like you and a blinking cursor. Um, and if you're <laughs> like the iconic, you can do what I want to, much. It's the end of the day. But like, ooh, that just makes me think of Carrie in the Sex and the City movie writing Love and then deleting it, and then she's done for the day. <laughs> it's like, I put in a day, I wrote Love, Love, period, delete. Um, and that it's the kind of the lack of kind of team camaraderie that you have is like that's kind of the hardest thing and the kind of um sticking to your commitment to the thing that you're trying to communicate but i feel like i don't know i have kind of evenly matched like i'm very anxious and self-conscious in a way that doesn't serve me and then i get so obsessed with these people i want to write about but somehow that like it barely allows me to get over that hurdle i think so it feels like um the incentives feel easier in conversational podcasts. You kind of know that you're going to have a good time. So I feel like getting back to, to something that could go either way is difficult, but it's, um, I have really missed it. It's nice to talk about it here. Thank you for asking that. Um, no word from Judy. Who is, does she have other boyfriends? Um, okay, any, any other questions? You write primarily about women. I do, yeah. And you go as far as meet somebody in an interview setting or phone call? You know, I'm writing about somebody kind of in recent history. I often don't know if they do kind of, I guess, based on where I started. This is probably true for a lot of people, but I see myself as a historian or a journalist. But I, and I think that when you, this is something I'm really kind of trying to figure out, but like, my weakness as an interviewer is that I'm a very codependent person. We'll do a great interview with somebody and then come away feeling like shackled to the fact that like I know what they want me to do. And if it's not what I'm gonna do, then I'm gonna feel really guilty about it. And so I managed to avoid that pain by not doing that. Um, but I think that um Janet Malcolm with the journalist and the burger is, is such a book, a great book on, on that kind of theme. Um, and one that I return to a lot. And I think um, that is something that I want to do more of because I think something I didn't understand when I was coming up, the kind of training is, as a scholar and historian in school was that I was like, okay, it's my job to like look at what's on the record and analyze that. And when I started with the first project I did where I started calling around doing interviews, I was like, oh my God. So all the information isn't out there waiting to be analyzed because people 
haven't asked the questions that I would ask. And you know, as long as you're going to ask even one question different from the people who've already been asking questions about this topic for however many years, then that can be so incredibly useful. And that was a big revelation for me. Every time I describe some of the revelations I had uh, in the course of being here today, and they're all things that when I describe them, I'm like, why didn't I know that until I was like 28? But I didn't. So, how it goes. Um, any other questions? Yeah, I'm going to talk about this a great question. I feel like, I mean, so we have listeners who are always suggesting great topics and they're often something that would be a really good fit. And if I'm doing the research, it's a question of, am I going to have the passion to, to do justice to it? Because I think research is such a time consuming thing. Um, and also that, you know, if I were to research something that I didn't have any particular passionate about, but I wouldn't necessarily bring insight to it either, and I could sort of assimilate the facts and give a timeline, say what happened, and that would all be perfectly fine, but that what's exciting about both recording something and listening to something is kind of hearing someone connecting with it and offering you a path to, to connect to it too, so it's, it's very personal. People, I was saying earlier today, people have been asking uh, since day one about doing a show, which we started it over five years ago to talk about Shinya O'Connor. I always kind of put it off because I didn't feel like the passion was there for me. And then I had a, a guest uh, who had just written a book about her named uh, Alison McCabe, and she was the right person in that moment to talk about Shinya O'Connor because she loves her so much. And that was kind of the one component that I didn't have to offer. So it has to be, it has to be something I love or hate or feel really complicated somewhere in the middle of that. So I do have some episodes coming out early next year about Nancy Reagan, who I think was uh, a pretty bad person who had a really fascinating life and a very strange codependent marriage. And I find all that just yeah, you get you just kind of get snagged when you don't choose the topics that are, are gonna snag you. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, I had a really good question that I just wanted to answer and that was your like so many and um would you recommend that I would start with the series and that or do you know if you like that series or just doing ever or not two and you were just like what is what the data? Um, you're scrolling through and finding the topics that are intriguing to you. Um, this is good. We've been at it for a while. I think it would be, if you were to do it in a roughly chronological fashion, it would be an interesting ride because it starts off with like me and my co-founder and uh, our co-host Michael Hobbs being like, we're starting a podcast. Um, here we go. And then like having fun, getting better at it, feeling more comfortable. And then there's a good chunk where you just hear kind of desperation in our, in our voices because of the pandemic podcast. And we're just like, did not have anything else to do with our lives. Um, and that's a really fun period because we were just like, we have nothing else to do. We made so many episodes during that time. And then um, after October of 2021, Mike and I split up. He goes off to focus on his new show, and then I uh, have a series of guests coming in. So it's like new people, different kind of combinations of chemistry. Sometimes it works great, sometimes it doesn't. I won't speak out with any guests, but sometimes someone comes in and, you know, they don't really want to have a back and forth. They're like, I'm ready, let's go, I'm going to talk. Um, so it's there, it's kind of, it's an interesting progression, but really I think like anything that's compelling to you um, is a great place to start. There's definitely not like an overall plot. There's some little in-jokes that kind of build over time. But the, the only in-joke I can think of is just that I have a thing for Michael Dukakis. So, you know, <laughs> if you know about that. Everything also makes sense. <laughs> I went to Boston recently and I came out of the train station and it was like the Michael 
Dukakis, Dukakis Transit Center. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> Uh, anything else? We're really, we're talking about Michael Dukakis now. It's really getting into the good part of the night. <laughs> oh, so if you would repeat the name of the fangirl book again. Oh, yeah, it's called Everything I Need I Get From You. Everything I Need I Get From You. By Caitlin Tiffany. Okay. And then, um, so you, you're, you're a self proclaimed fangirl for newsies. Oh, yeah. And you would call yourself fangirl if that term is okay. Yes. Okay. What, what other things are you a big fan girl for? I mean, I know a few of you listen to the podcast, but you know, I just want you to share. Yeah, I do really love Godzilla. I like that was big. I fell in love with Godzilla last year. I watched the original Godzilla, and uh, I remember saying to a friend, "I feel like that little girl in the like viral video from 15 years ago, who's like four and she like can't stop crying because she loves Justin Bieber so much." <laughs> I feel about Godzilla. Uh, I really love the Saw movie. <laughs> I think they're so fun. Because like when people are like, Saw, that's first report. I'm like, no. First of all, the first movie was a top thriller where you only saw Carrie always acting like he was sawing and stood off. And then the other report after that, and that's not my problem. But that they become like this bizarre soap opera where you're like, there are people in a trap, but who cares about them? What we really care about is this found family of serial killers, where there's a serial killer patriarch and his adopted daughter who's helping him, and his adopted son who's helping him, and they're fighting. Oh no, and his wife is there too. Who did he love the most? Let's keep competing over the legacy of this dead serial killer. Um, and that's a really great family drama. Succession so found him in a dish. <laughs> I, I should say a third thing I'm a fangirl of. I only like two things that can't be right. We wouldn't have. We wouldn't have. And, uh, yeah. Well, and I, I saw recently they had a re release of um, Stop Making Sense, the Talking Heads concert song. It was remastered, and I went to see that and loved it. And now I think I'm a I'm a David Byrne fan girl. And when I have like my advice for surviving a long winter, when I wake up and I have like zero endorsements, like no motivation to do anything, I put on um the section of that film that's of them performing like during wartime because all the choreography is like aerobic space. <laughs> so you watch David Byrne just like aerobicizing and running around the stage for six minutes. And you're like, okay, okay, I'm going. Um, so that's a new fangirl thing. But yeah, I, I think um, fangirls are a very important part of culture who I hope are, are finally getting their due. Any, anything with a recommendation for what to do when you wake up and have no will to do anything? I really love a second thing in case <laughs> the day to burn a workout stops working for me. <laughs> and I have coffee always usually does the trick. Yeah. Okay, I'm not gonna peer pressure you guys to ask any more questions. Yeah, oh yeah. What where do you get your news from? Where do you you know news media? What do you what do you believe? Oh wow. <laughs> I don't know. I think I get most of my news from my across the street neighbor who watches the news all day. And he's like, Did you hear about the thing that's happening? And I'm like, No. <laughs> um, I believe, uh, and it's funny, we kind of were talking earlier about how I did an episode recently about how, you know, the New York Times is the sort of center left paper of record, which has been consistently and pointedly really awful in its coverage of trans issues. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, it feels like everything today has to have some kind of a caveat, you know, where you kind of, it feels very of the previous era of media to sort of accept new stories that, you know, for example, say, sources say, as opposed to the police told us, mm -hmm. and therefore we're repeating it, um, which is not, I don't know, it's a, it's a very interesting period because I feel like the way some people have become you know, psychologically unmoored and reflect that partly by 
telling everything fake news and kind of bringing up the narratives about how you know it was a false flag operation, whatever, like is part of a much bigger, scarier picture, but it's it's to me, it makes sense to trace that to some extent to the fact that we, we all know that we are being manipulated to some extent. It's just how much. And so I think, um, I think the way I feel about news is kind of, it's probably reflected in the the whole um, project of the show, which is that everything we, we learn is provisional and kind of based on what we can figure out to this point, but that the sort of context and the reasons for why people are doing what they're doing are going to be hard for us to assess until you know until things kind of happen the way they're going to happen but it, it takes us i don't know i think i i um i really should consume more news media i'm so overwhelmed by kind of the amount of the torrent of information in daily life that i think i i feel guilty about not knowing more about what's going on in the world right now. um but i think that the to me the most the way that makes sense to process that is to, you know, find sources that you find that you trust and that people that you trust trust, and then kind of take everything with a grain of salt because it's all what we figured out to this point. Mm -hmm. Meditation hour. Anything else? These have been such great questions. Yeah. yeah, I think um, Chris is going to talk about a new point on Tua on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, since we just mentioned Nova Valley, well, I wanted to ask how it was um, being on Tua. I know it was the first um, mm -hmm. tour for you, but uh, uh, I listened to a lot of podcasts and a really famous German one I listened to. Um, they they just said um, that it was a really overwhelming feeling mm -hmm. that they were in front of the crowd for the first time. And I would like to know what works for you and if you enjoy it now. And yeah. Hey, well, thank you for asking. Yeah, it was really fun. We did it um, just a couple shows last year, and then the, the start of this year, yeah, we did go on a big multi city tour. I think it was 13 shows in total. And I realized from that that probably eight is the maximum that I should do. And anything above that, it just kind of gets progressively harder to snap back into form. Um, and it was a show where they kind of, the big finish for each show was that I would have somebody pie me because like shove a pie in my face, which really was just a pie shell with whipped cream in it. But you know, it has a, a sort of theatrical effect we were looking for. And what I realized doing that was that like the second, because we have to like, I couldn't just get pie and we had the, you know, beers like you do not uh, the big fits over everything that they have. And so we would like gaffer tape down some garbage bags and like have me take off my glasses and go stand there and be like, I'm unsuspecting. I wonder what will happen to me now. <laughs> um, but what the simple point you realize is that the second I took my glasses off and I had no control over what happened to me and my job was just to stand there and be pie, I felt like the the most amazing feeling of freedom actually. I felt kind of just like totally relaxed and in my element and sort of euphoric, which I think is what I would not have suspected, but I kind of found that moment along the way. Um, and then the, the funny thing about touring, aside from how it kind of, you know, it adds up city by city, is that you're in this kind of wonderful, intense kind of moment of intimacy with like a, you know, an audience of like a couple hundred people or more. Um, and you close, and it's amazing, and there's applause, and you're so happy. And then you go home to your hotel room, and it's like dead silent, and you watch diners, drive-ins, and the third thing. <laughs> and it's like this abrupt, this like really abrupt change of emotional temperature that feels like hard to know, but to how to process that. But um, but the actual, what I would say is that the all the prep around it, the travel, the kind of nerves, the anxieties are very stressful, and then once you're actually there and the show is happening, like it just feels, it felt really fantastic to me. Um, and so I recommend, I don't know, having experiences 
like that within performance or whatever else that you're like, I don't know what I'll feel like when I'm doing that because it can be, it can be very surprising how it ends up feeling. That's that's a good last question. I'll answer your mind. Yeah. What products do you love other than your own? <laughs> I I love that you think I love my own shower. <laughs> And the one about it um, because it's something I do and I'm made of spiders. Uh, what podcast do I love? I love Happy Weight. I think it's such a, a brilliant show in terms of just the places that it goes emotionally and, and sort of the, the feelings that it allows me to have as an audience member. Um, there's a show that is like not very much listened to at all, but which I adore called Wait Five Minutes, which is about the history of Florida. Um, done by a Floridian who's got like a very soothing voice. Um, and that was would be like, today we're talking about Florida Panthers, Florida, whatever. <laughs> Delightful. Um, and then I love um, Sentimental Garbage, which is a podcast by Caroline O'Donoghue when I found it, when many other people found it, which is that there's a series within it called Sentimental in the City, which is about sex in the city, in which I recommend anyone who likes Sex in the City, but even if you don't, because it is kind of using the show as a jumping off point to kind of talk about, basically I have two women talking about all the emotional intelligence they gathered in Owen while dating at the storm, um, and just having relationships and being a person in the world, and I, I found it um, after many people recommended it to me, and I was like, shut up, leave me alone, I finally listened to it last year. And uh, it just felt like so, so delightful just for the kind of dynamic that the two of them have together, but also just wonderful as, as something that validates all of the, the information and the insight and the kind of depth of, of feeling and character that you gather just by having relationships, putting energy and time into them, because I think we, you know, live in a culture that trains us to really think about our, our lives in terms of how many hours of productivity am I squeezing out of myself by doing the daily burn workout every morning. And it's like we need these powerful reminders that you know our relationships are our treasures um, and they're what make us who we are. Um, so I thought three, that feels good. Um, I'm happy with three. And yeah, give yourself a hand. You're the right <laughs> And thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Um, safe, safe travels.